for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. <laughs> yeah. How you doing? It's Thursday night. February 1st, by the way. 32, day, 32 days into the new year. Just 333 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. Now, I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? Are you ready? It's Thursday. It is Fader Night. And the No More Fake Newsroom with John Rappaport, followed by Open Lines. The call-in numbers are 323-825-5045 or 323-275-9695. Serena Wright-Taylor is going to be here in a few minutes from the Conscious Life Expo. Tell us about some of the special events and tickets and all of that stuff. So we're going to do that in just a minute. Before that, follow on Twitter right now at J Church Radio. At J Church Radio. Come on, follow me. I'm a big, big social media person. Okay, well, I've got a lot of stuff going on. You know, fade to black and Rita and our lives and busy, busy, busy. And I still do the the social media thing. You know, I'm wondering, I mean, will it ever get to the point where, you know, I back off of Twitter or Facebook? Now, I haven't done Instagram. Uh, you know, we have an Instagram account. That's, uh, that's Rita's thing. So I don't do IG. All right, let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Yeah, this is Richard Doty. How are you doing, Jimmy? Hey, Richard. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. You sound amazing. You sound perfectly, you sound like you're here in the studio underground. <laughs> Richard. We're good. We're good connection. Richard Doty. Okay. Um, welcome to the show. Uh, as you, you um, well, I'm going to say this to the, I'm completely surprised by this and you already know that. Um, so there you go. But Richard, you've been talked about a lot on this show uh, over the years. Uh, what, what are you up to these days? Well, I'm, um, I'm just working for uh, a couple different uh, producers and trying to get some things uh, produced uh, and on the air, uh, doing some ad- advising mostly uh, with uh, a, a particular producer. I can't, I can't discuss who, but, and I can't discuss really the project, but we've been working a lot in Nevada uh, filming. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, we filmed uh um th- uh, two three days in Nevada and uh, just different sites in Nevada for a an upcoming uh series. So Richard, is it okay if we speak freely? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um I know that I know that you know that I know that you know <laughs> about about <laughs> your about your history in the past and 
and uh, the the information, the stories, and so forth, and and video uh, and interviews. And 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 information and and stuff. It, it's been in the UFO community for a very 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 long time, and there are those out there, myself included, that uh, when we go through uh, your part of of our history, you know, our collective history, that there is a very disturbing part of it that makes us you know, feel a little uncomfortable, a little dirty and, and myself included. Um, and you were, you were right in the middle of that heated, heated, uh, uh, area looking back. Um, and we can, we can certainly talk about anything that you would like to talk about now, but today, do you feel any, any guilt or would you go back and change anything when it comes to, uh, Benowitz or the way that things went down or was it just your job in the Air Force and you were just doing what you were told? Well, going back to uh, those days in the 80s, uh, I had a job to do. I was sanctioned to do certain things, certain missions uh, based on a, uh, a larger plan uh, and there were and first of all, let me let, let me say that I wasn't the only person involved in this. There's a 122 other uh, agents that were uh, doing what I was doing, investigating uh, an phenomena, uh, UFO sightings, UFO incidents involving Air Force or uh, occurring on uh, Air Force installations or in the vicinity Air Force installations. Right. And so when we go back to the Benowitz incident or Benowitz uh, operation. Uh, I did what I was told to do. I was, I mean, it was, I was, uh, given a mission and I did my mission, but, uh, a lot of what, what is, 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 uh, spread in the internet, uh, isn't factual. Uh, they, they, I know I, I heard somebody on, um, coast to coast some, some months ago talking about it, saying how I brainwashed Paul Benowitz and well, if anyone knew Paul Benowitz, he was a very a strict, uh, down-to-earth type of person. And he was his own personality, if you can understand what that means. He, has his, he had his own thought pattern and own, uh, own reasoning. And so I couldn't have convinced him to do something that he didn't want to do. I never had to convince him to do anything during this operation. He, he, was, he was convinced that he was in contact with extraterrestrials. All I had to do was go along with what he said, and we did with me and some others. We just said, you know, Paul, if you think that's an extraterrestrial you have on that screen, then, then I'm going to believe you. And, and, and so that, that's all we did. We, we just – we – sat back and listened to him and he convinced himself that what he was doing, what he was seeing, the pictures that he was taking involved uh, extraterrestrials. And when years later, uh, when I sat down with him after this was all over with and told Paul, Paul, listen, what you were seeing really wasn't you. He, I couldn't convince him otherwise. He wasn't going to listen to me. So uh, it was real easy uh, an easy operation because he he convinced himself to believe into it. But there was uh, okay. Let me ask you a couple of. Let's actually clear the air, right? You were there, sure. okay. Uh, um, and I'm not sure if it was me that was hosting on Coast to Coast uh, that night. I don't remember uh, a converse that conversation. So I I, I don't know which you're referring to directly, but certainly that has been mentioned a lot uh, over the years, that, that that's what went on. But but let me ask you this. Did you go into Benowitz's house and move his furniture around to mess with him? Did that ever happen? No, absolutely not. That's, a, that's absolutely false. I wouldn't have had permission to do that. I mean, I couldn't have, unless I got some sort of a search warrant, uh, to do that, uh, I, I couldn't have possibly done that, and I didn't do that. Did anybody in the Air Force move furniture around in his house? 
Not, not that I know of, not that I know of, but you have to understand that there was another agency intimately involved in this and that, that was the national security agency. Right. They didn't coordinate what they were doing with us. And, 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 the, and the particular incident I tell people is that when I was, I was at Paul's house, myself and another agent by the name of Steve Adset, we were at his house one night. It was a rainy night in Albuquerque. And Paul said, there's somebody across the street in that house in the corner. And, and Paul said, but that house is vacant. There shouldn't be anybody in there. So we, we watched and we could see lights going on over there and we could re- we I realized what we were seeing were were lights on a, on a camera, a video camera. Not, and I, you understand this is like 1983, 82, 83 time frame. Right. And so and so I said, you know what, somebody's somebody's recording something over there, Paul. So Steve and I went out. Uh, I'd called uh, an Albuquerque police department officer that I knew he arrived and he's parked a block away and we, we came up an alley and we saw a vehicle parked behind this vacant house. And so uh, we recorded the license number. The LB, uh, the Albuquerque police officer knocked on the door because it was locked. Somebody came to the door. We, he identified himself with, federal credentials as a agent and the Albuquerque police officer whose name, his name was Daryl turned to me and he said, do you guys know each other? And I looked at his credentials and it was national security agency. And I said, what are you guys doing here? He said, we're doing the same thing you're doing. I said, oh, well, we need to coordinate this. He said, well, you're going to have to coordinate with our supervisors. And he shut the door and I and I and the, the the APD officer knocked on the door again and said, "Hey, you guys have permission here?" He said, "Yeah, we're renting the house." And so, so that's an example of them doing something that wasn't coordinated with us. We had no idea what they were doing. The next day, I contacted the NSA representative on on base, mm-hmm. and I had a my myself uh, and and my supervisor went to their office, sat down, and said, "Listen." If you guys are doing something regarding this operation, then we need to know about it. And the supervisor said, we, we'll tell you what we, we can tell you. And they did. But it, we knew, or I realized, that they were doing more than they were telling us they were doing. What did they say that so, they were doing, Richard? Do you remember? They, they, were, they, were in, they were interested in his communications devices, how he was... And and this isn't a secret anymore. But Paul was actually tapping. I don't know how exactly. I'm not a I'm not a scientist, but he was tapping into a community a secure communications system on Kirtland that that was uh, operated by the National Security Agency. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we started this because NSA tasked us with with investigating it. And so, and I'm not sure how he did it, but they were interested to know how he was doing it and whether he was working with anyone else. Right. Uh, so that's that's why they were involved in it. The famous box of pictures that he had in his home. Uh, again, we're going to refer to urban legend here, <laughs> Richard. That you saw the pictures that he was taking. And that's that some of these pictures clearly showed craft on the ground with, uh, you know, flying saw. Literally, that was the description with legs lit up, refueling, taken off uh, at Kirkland and that you saw these photographs. And then after uh, those photographs disappeared and the box disappeared. What can you tell me about that? Well, (laughs) yeah, there's there's maybe uh, 5% of that accurate. Uh, most of it's not. He had a, he had a box of, of photographs. Actually, it was a, uh, a, um, a file box that you could lock. And he kept, when I first met Paul, going back sometime, myself and Jerry Miller were all, over in his residence, and we were discussing his, his uh, computer system he had. And, of course, this was back in the 80s, and he had a, pretty sophisticated computer system and plus all these other 
uh, electronic devices that he had on his roof. And he, he kept pointing to a box on his desk in, in his uh, house, and he said, that right there will prove the existence of what, I'm, what I have here. He kept saying that to us, but he would never open it and show us. Eventually, one day, one night after dinner, I was there with, with him, having dinner with him and his wife. I asked Paul, I said, what about, these, uh, what about that box you kept pointing to? What's in that box? He said, photographs. I said, well, can I see it? So he opened, we went uh, from his dining room table to his office. He opened up the box and he laid out on a big table, a, a somewhat a conference table. He said, I want you to go into the other room and I'm going to lay these out because I don't want you to see what order I'm putting them in. Well, I'm going to eventually see it. But I said, I did what he asked me to do. I came back and I, I looked at him. I wasn't supposed to touch him, but he did have, he had, I don't know how many, uh, quite a few, I'd say maybe 50, uh, some, somewhere between 45 and 50 photographs of, of UFOs that were on the ground, that were in the air, that were flying next to aircrafts. Well, some of them I recognized as, as photographs taken somewhere else or in some other uh, venue. Uh, one particular one I saw that I recognized immediately was an, it was a photograph of the McMinnville, Oregon incident. And I'm sure, Jimmy, you know about that. Of course, in, right. Sometime in the 50s. I, I don't remember exactly when in the 50s. Well, I looked at these, and I didn't want to embarrass him and say, well, you know, I've seen these before. So a lot of them were pictures that were had already been in, in, cir in, in circuit someplace, uh, in magazines or, or, or some other. Of course, we didn't have the Internet back then, so it had to have been in magazines or books or something. And, and it looked to me like most of them were a picture of a picture. And, but there were some that he, he, that he had taken, and it was clear that he had taken them over Kirtland uh, Air Force Base uh, because of the uh, terrain. I could look at the terrain and see it was Kirtland. But he took pictures of things, and I, I can't to this day uh, explain what he, was, what he took a picture of. In fact, our, we had an expert, had some another agent who was a photographic uh, specialist come in and look at these pictures to see, to try to figure out what is that and when was that taken. And he had a date, he had dates on, so we knew when it was taken. But we, there wasn't any other record uh, on base of anybody reporting a, a particular UFO or, or or some other craft, unusual craft flying next to a an aircraft coming in for landing. So he had some that were unexplained, but most of those were easily explained as, a, as him taking a picture of a picture. Did you, um, again, I'm referring to urban legend. Uh, you're with me now, and I appreciate uh, uh, you being here and, and answering these questions because we, these are things that we've always wanted to know. Did you provide Paul Beno Benowitz uh, documents pertaining to, to the UFO subject proving the existence of UFOs that you created? No, no, no. What we, what we, I didn't even do it. I, another uh, agent uh, uh, did this and, and we, we took um, a particular briefing document that uh, we had and we let, uh, Paul read it. And, it, and it was in fact uh, classified. I mean, the classification wasn't real. We put a classification on it to convince Paul that what he was reading was real. But I didn't do that. I wasn't there at the time. In fact, during that time period, I was in Washington D.C. doing something else. But some other people had done that. Now, NSA had a long two-hour meeting with Paul. Uh, sometime towards the end of the operation. And I'm not sure what they did or what they showed him. Uh, I know what has been written, and I, I know why you asked that question, but uh, I never uh, personally showed him anything like that. Why? What's the goal in doing something like that? 
you know, is it? Well, it, one of the, is, well okay, I'll, I'll let you answer that because you know I've got like three questions that are, <laughs> that are right behind that. But, okay. but but what what's the goal in 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 doing that? It's spreading. It's spreading something. Uh, spreading disinformation. You're, you that that's what you want to say. Yes. Absolutely, I agree with you hundred percent. But. What we what we do is okay. Hold on, Richard. Somebody, hold on, Richard. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That, let's back up for a second. You said that you okay. showed him a briefing document that you changed the class. You added a classification to. Are you saying that that briefing document was not that that was disinformation, or was the briefing document an actual briefing document? I'm confused. No, no, it wasn't a briefing document. It was a uh, it was disinformation. It wasn't real. It I mean, some re- of the things in it probably was. Like I said, I didn't. I saw this later. I I saw it in the file later that it was done by an, another agent. Uh, so when you say me, I didn't. My my organization, Air Force OSI, did. Right. But I didn't personally. That, so uh, yeah, I, that's what I wanted. Uh, to, I didn't create it. Right. That's but, what I wanted to. They did. They did. Yes, <laughs> okay. OSI yeah. OSI did. It was a fake document yep. with a f- fake classification used for disinformation uh, shown to Paul Benowitz. You were in D.C. You weren't there when the fake document was shown to him. Now, right? Um, but, right? But okay. I, I agree. Now, right. now, now, now we're clear. Okay, I just wanted to get that out of the way. Okay. I didn't know if you – see, it sounded like you had suggested that the document was real. You just added a top-secret classification, but that wasn't the case. It was, it was, it was a fake document all along. Got it. Okay, right. so uh, it, but, but it wasn't top secret. It was secret. It was secret. I don't believe it was top secret. I can, re- I, I, as far as I can remember, it, it, it was secret. I believe it was just secret. And it was a, I think it was a one or two page, like a summary. Uh, it's been a long time, so I, I can't remember. But, but the reason we do this, the reason we did that, is if somebody was. If somebody had gotten into some real information, some real top secret communications systems or real top secret operations that were occurring on Kirtland that involved some really highly classified uh, projects, we want, would want that person to think that what they were actually seeing was UFOs and not real U.S. government operations where they can go out and start spreading this out, and and eventually during that time period, of course, the Soviets would 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 end up with it. So so it's a it's a what we don't call it a, a disinformation, we call it counterintelligence. It's a counterintelligence operation where we try to keep them thinking, okay, it's it's a UFO. It's not really a a a. a uh, I mean, we think we want them to think it's a UFO and not the real operation that they might have accidentally got into. And now this disinformation, obviously, is going to uh, snowball throughout the UFO community, too, as well. I mean, was that part of well, it? Was that part of your goal? No, and we 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 didn't uh, at that point. Uh, we didn't look beyond Paul Benowitz. The operation was was uh, targeted uh, for Paul Benowitz and his company, Thunder Scientific. Right. Uh, and what what where it went from there? What, what wouldn't be our responsibility? And and let me tell you now what. And this is no longer classified because it was declassified some years ago. Um, what the Air Force was doing, what NSA was doing was they had a facility on Kirtland that was shooting a laser at Soviet satellites as it was coming over. And there was a communication system used to, to mask. Uh, and I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm explaining as a lay person sure. as, as to mask it. And, and Paul had tapped into that communication system and the frequencies involved in doing this. And, and what this, uh, what this uh, laser would do is is basically blind the Soviet satellite as it was flying over, and they had it there, and they had it out of Area Fifty One, and they had it at, at a couple other facilities. And this was an experimental stage; they, they they didn't have an operational, but they were they were doing that. And so that's why it was highly classified back then. 
So that's why we couldn't let that out. But why not? And and certainly hindsight is very dangerous, uh, Richard, but (laughs) why not just tell them the truth? Why not just tell them, as an American citizen, you would understand, hey, man, you know, it's the Soviets, we got this thing going on, you've tapped into that, it's not UFOs, and this is very highly classified, so just do your duty as a patriot and keep your mouth shut, that's what's really going on, no harm, no foul. Well, uh, like you said, hindsight's always twenty twenty, or most of the time is twenty twenty. but uh, I, I wasn't in a position to... Uh, write the operations operational plan. This comes from a supervisor or headquarters in Washington, uh, intelligence community, and they they decide on what how they are going to uh, conduct these operations and how they're going to target people. And I'm the player in the bottom of the totem pole that is actually doing this. I'm the agent in the field doing this. So yeah, it it, it would it would probably at some in some instances, it would be uh, better to just tell them the truth, but um, I didn't have the option of doing that. Might have saved a man's life, you know, uh, again, hindsight. But let me, okay, now let's, let's, let's keep going. I've got 100 questions for you, Richard. <laughs> so let's well, let just... me talk to you. Let me say something about Paul Benowitz. Paul Benowitz, um, he, he smoked three to four packs of cigarettes a day, right. and he, he drank um Continuously, every time you looked at him, he had uh, a Coca Cola. He would he would have not a not a can, but a quart size. Uh, so he wasn't in very good health in the early eighties. And even when he when they made him stop smoking later on, uh, he uh, you know his health had deteriorated because of him uh, because of the the, the the cigarette smoking. I mean, I was in the room his in his hospital room when a doctor came in and said to him, Paul, you killed yourself over these 55 years of smoking. And there's nothing we can do about that, but we're trying to do everything we can to keep your, you know, keep your life active. But, but, but that's, you know, Paul wasn't in the best of of physical condition. So when we say might've kept him alive, I, I would doubt that. Uh, I know he went in the hospital. He had a neurosis breakdown, but but that was, ca- was caused by a couple other factors. One of them is business. Thunder Scientific Laboratories uh, had lost a real big contract because of him. Paul Paul was so hung up with this uh, this UFO f- business that he he neglected what he should have been doing in his uh, business. Well, of course, Richard. Of course. Because he was shown documents that they were real from his own government. And so, absolutely, I think, if, <laughs> I cannot imagine how many people would be pushed over the edge, you know, uh, given that same circumstance. You know, myself included. You know, that's a pretty crazy thing to show to somebody. We always, you know, we have that question, you know, are we being visited? I've, what am I seeing in the sky? Is it is it real? Is it this? And then you know your own government t- says, "Hey, man, okay, you know they're real, and we want you to come and 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 work with us." That that to somebody that may not be already stable is is a is a bad position to put somebody in. I wasn't there, but I'm just saying if I was shown documents and. And from the government, not from, you know, some ufologist, right? But from the Air Force themselves, holy crap, right? Well, okay, let me, let's, uh, and that's my take. Uh, I, I don't know about the cigarettes and and, and the physical health and, and the Coca-Cola, but you're making me want to change my diet for sure. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is this, Richard, what about the the Dulcy uh, situation um, there again. I'm, I'm I'm going back to urban legend, but did you push him in that direction as well? The underground base? No, no, no. Paul had already uh, prior to us becoming involved in this operation. Paul had already made a number of trips to Dulcy, and uh, he had gotten information from this other person. 
and I don't really want to bring this other person involved in it, but there's actually, it was an operation never been disclosed, but, uh, there was a, um, uh, an operation involving another person, uh, that was Paul's friend in this, this whole, uh, business. And, um, he got Paul involved in a Dulce incident, Archuleta Peak. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Paul, excuse me. Paul, Paul told me, uh, one day when I was having con- uh, a discussion with him, he said, well, I know where the alien base is located. It's up in Dulce, New Mexico. It's at Archuleta Peak. And I said, well, how do you know that? He said, because I've been up there and I've taken pictures. And then he showed me, well, he showed me a video. He flew over it, it, right? He he took a plane up there. Yeah, he he took a plane up there. Right. But, and, and he'd, he'd taken some pictures of, of some things and, and he actually, uh, him and this, this other, his colleague had camped up there overnight or camped near there overnight. I I believe they slept in a vehicle or, or, or something, but anyways, they spent the night and they took some videos that were really, really, I mean, I looked at these videos and I couldn't explain them. I thought, wow, look, this is really neat. So anyways, I said to Paul, I said, well, take me up there sometime. So we did. We went up there. We sat around. We looked around. We didn't, you know, we drove around, uh, didn't really see much, but he, he pointed out where everything was at. Well, a, a week or so later, we went up there and we, we went up there. So we were, be, would be up there at night. And then we saw helicopters. We saw helicopters. We saw all these strange lights up there. And I started wondering, what the heck was this stuff? So when when we got back, I said to Paul, I said, we, you know, I don't know what that is, Paul. I I, I said, but those helicopters were were Vietnam era helicopters. I mean, I I know that they were Hueys or uh, I I said, but and then there were some I don't I couldn't recognize. So I said, but I don't know about those those strange lights and those strange beams. I don't know what they were. Well, <clears throat> I went up to Fort Carson, Colorado, a few weeks later, and met with a, a special forces unit up there, and found out that uh, they used that area for military operations. And I asked uh, one of the pilots, actually the commander, he was also the, one of the senior pilots. Uh, about these strange lights or strange beams. He said, well, he said, we have lights underground. I mean, we have these uh, lights that are, that are in the, built in the ground that would shine up, and they simulated different uh, uh, things for the helicopter pilots. He says, so we turn them on when helicopter pilots are coming in. He says, so I can just imagine how strange they would look if somebody was down on the bottom of the mountain looking up. So that explained to me what they were, but I never told Paul that. And, and, and Paul would, would always tell people that there was an underground base in Archuleta. I never told him there was, and I, I, I didn't, I didn't ever support that because it really wasn't in the operational plan. I mean, that, that was just something that he, he wanted to believe in and would let him, you know, if he wants to believe in it, he can believe in it. But yeah, and so well, uh, Richard. I, no, I, so I never told him there was a base. Right, but you didn't tell him that there wasn't a base. No, I. I that's right. I didn't tell him there wasn't a base. Did he seem at that time? Did he seem stable? Um, and wouldn't it have maybe again yeah. hindsight, right? But to to maybe not uh, mess with them at all, and maybe come clean on that, and tell them that you know these are special operations forces up there, and I thought it was something strange, so I went and checked it out for myself. I spoke to them, and this is actually what's going on. Well, he knew I went to Fort Carson because I told him that, and uh, but he he was under the impression that the the, the government. Uh, I mean, I don't have enough time. Uh, here, I would take uh, hours and hours to explain to you sure. what Paul told me and what he thought he knew, and so it was very difficult for me to 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 convince, try to convince him otherwise. So I never did. Paul would would spend uh, thirty minutes talking to me without me ever saying a word. He was conv- trying to convince me that what he was seeing was in fact extraterrestrial. And he would go on and on and on and on. And, and I would, couldn't, couldn't get a word in edgewise. And I finally would say to him, you know, I'd make the timeout sign. I'd say, Paul, timeout. I'm going to have to 
step in here and say a few words. And at times, I would try to convince him to stray him back onto what we wanted him, and, and he wouldn't. He would get off the subject. And then years later, I mean, I was, I was friends with Paul right up until he, he passed away. He was my friend. He would call me. He would invite me over to his house. My wife and, my, and, and went over there. We had dinner a number of times. We went out to dinner. And, and at those times, I tried. I tried my darnest to convince Paul that it was what he was seeing was not extraterrestrial. I never told him it was, you know, what the the, the classified project was. But I, I I told him, Paul, you didn't see you didn't see a, uh, extraterrestrials. What you're seeing on that computer screen isn't an extraterrestrial talking to you. But he 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 couldn't be. He wouldn't listen to me. And he had a computer screen. And oh, I think it was a Commodore, or uh, I think they were called Commodores back then. Mm-hmm. Anyways, he had a screen, he had it rigged up, and he had a, all these antennas in, on his roof, and he had a, he had a, actually a small microwave. Actually, he we actually had FCC came in and made him get a license for it. But anyways, he had a little a small portable microwave on his roof, and he would look at the screen, and there would be images on the screen, but. It, certainly more, uh, wasn't of an alien, but he was convinced that was. And I would actually tell him, Paul, I don't see anything. He said, I see it and I can hear him. And he had these earphones that he would put on and he said, I can hear him talking. I said, well, what language are they speaking? He said, they're speaking their language. I said, well, you don't understand their language, do you, Paul? He said, no, but I know that it's an intelligent language. And he wrote a whole, gosh, probably a hundred page uh, 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 document or typed it was typed about the alien language. He, he wrote and he, he gave it to us when he came out to Kirtland to present, give his presentation to all these generals, he presented them with that. And plus all these other d- documents that he created to convince, try to convince them, them that the, the Kirtland air force base was in danger of an alien invasion. What does the Air Force know? What is it that they are not telling us, not about Paul Benowitz, about the UFO question? What do they know? Well, I know what I was briefed on and uh, in 1979, and uh, I'm convinced I have no reason to, to, to think otherwise or to believe otherwise that we had been visited. We have been visited. Roswell was real. There were other crash sites that were real, and the Air Force knows. The government knows, not just the Air Force, but the whole government knows, and they have known. And and so what I was briefed on was what occurred in the uh, f- late 40s and 50s. Now, what has happened since I got, I left uh, the, uh, the the intelligence community in 1988, so I, I don't know what, I know a lot of people claimed I, I'm still involved, and they know that somebody got my records and found that I was recalled active duty back in 1983, 84. I was, but it wasn't anything to do with UFOs. So uh, uh, I can't say it, what, it was, didn't surprise me of the, uh, the, the release by the Air Force and admission that they had been that had this project that, it, that they had for a number of years. Uh, that was started. I mean, that's the that's the unclassified portion of it. I'm I'm convinced, and I have still friends that are involved. I'm convinced that the Air Force still is investigating these things, and they're still involved uh, in in this project. How did the briefing? When you say that you were briefed on Roswell and other crashes, how how does that happen? Were you shown documents and photographs? Or was it verbal? There's a, there, no, it was a. It, there's a. Uh, I think there were twenty some of of us in the room. Uh, it, it's a special. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Air Force Special Security Office that you briefed in. It's uh, code word. Uh, you had to have special clearances to do to, to get into this program. It's a it's a briefing uh, video or a, a film it's, it's back in those days it was like a i don't know whatever 16 millimeter or whatever they were that he used it was a film a film a briefing intelligence people on this subject and it showed 
uh, old uh, uh, films of the recovery of the Roswell crash, the two crashes, the one at uh, Corona, New Mexico, and the one at uh, Magdalena out at uh, uh, Horse Mesa. Uh, and what the air, what it is in, was in the briefing document. There was two. There was t- two aliens crash, crashed that crashed that collided in air and then crashed at two different locations, one in Corona, mm-hmm. not Roswell. It was north of Roswell, but near Corona, south, southeast of Corona. And then one, the other uh, crash crashed uh, north or uh, southwest of Magdalena, New Mexico. That craft, what, that crash site wasn't found until 1949. The crash site near Corona was found in 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 47 right. in the summer of 47 the, the, and it was one live alien that was found in the craft the crash site in corona the one in 49 they found bodies but they were they were uh uh decayed uh horribly uh so but but the crafts were similar in nature and so and and over during the investigation process back in those days they just figured that these two crafts collided and they think it was an electrical storm and i know los alamos was involved in this and they i think one of the scientists figured it it probably was some kind of electrical storm that that caused it anyways and and then the briefing and then there's a colonel that gave this briefing and he went on to reiterate a lot of different things and how the 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 government was still investigating these things and and that there was possibly the possibility that there were uh, extraterrestrials visiting Earth that that we, we the government didn't know about, but they wanted to keep track of. And when Reagan became president, Reagan was briefed on an incident, and I don't know the full details of it that had occurred uh, in uh, around Washington D.C. and. The a craft was landed, and 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 I don't think this was ever has ever been disclosed by anybody. But and it was I think it was in eighty two or the latter part of eighty one. And anyways, that scared the government. That scared the Air Force. That scared the CIA. It scared the FBI, and it scared Reagan. And Reagan then started another program to try to keep track and 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 try to develop some kind of a system to keep track of everything that entered uh, Earth's orbit. And that was part of the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative. Right. Did you, um, that's fascinating stuff, and I had never heard uh, heard that before, um, and neither has the audience. I'm sure that uh, this uh, those comments will uh, be uh, uh, <laughs> circulating tomorrow around the internet. Well, Art Bell, uh, Art Bell knows about. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I discussed um, that with Art Bell years ago. <laughs> okay, um, is uh, uh, a couple of other things when um, uh, the this this thing that happened uh, a couple of months ago now, it's December sixteenth, uh, with that uh, disclosure that went into the media. Um, is is that part of it? Is that something that the Air Force would be involved in, in in that type of disclosure with the uh, with the gun camera footage from the Navy? Uh, you know, this is the Pentagon program that apparently was running uh, that nobody knew about. Senator Harry Weir, you know, you know everything about the or Harry Reid. I'm sorry. Um, is that is that part of disinfo? I don't think so. I, I think that's probably uh, somebody, uh, an office up there that is trying to get out and getting the truth out, a disclosure out. And I'm all for disclosures. I, I've tried and, and a number of times and, and, you know, people say, well, you disinformation. I can't, we can't believe anything you say. Well, you know what? You can't believe what I say because I did my job back in those days, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not with the government anymore. Are they paying? Oh, oh, okay. The are they? Are they? Are you being paid by them to be on to call into this show and surprise me tonight? No, absolutely okay. not. Okay. All right. Nobody's paying okay. me for this. Absolutely not. Well, you know they're. Th- you I'm know, not being paid by the government okay. in any way. 
You know, they're saying this yeah. right now out there. They're going, you know. Uh, I, know. It, you know, you I know. know. I okay. know. You can't convince uh, people. You know, the Phil Class once told me at a UFO convention some years ago, and I had a pretty good relationship with Phil, even though I, I, I called him uh, names and, and, and threatened to beat his butt if he was, was a little younger. But, I mean, and joke in a joking manner. But Phil told me, he said, you know what? I don't have to do anything. I have to sit here. The UFO community does more harm to themselves than I could ever do. And that's the truth. Well, that's the truth. well, and which, which takes me to this. So let's, let's back up. Uh, 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 has there been an active disinfo campaign going on inside of the UFO community with other researchers and conferences and conventions around the country? Not not uh, disinformation, but what we did do, and I was involved in this, was that we planted or we co-opted people that were already involved in the UFO community, such as Bill Moore. Uh, you we know, co that, that's where I was we, going. We co-opted okay. yeah, co them to report on activities that are recurring within UFO groups, APRO, uh, which was you know, way back, you know, you know mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and MUFON mm -hmm. and some of these other, other groups, we would just, uh, sometimes pay people to report to us what the, what the UFO group was collecting. We never, ever, in fact, we were absolutely prohibited pro from providing information to these groups. All we wanted to do was for them to report back to us. Did and, Bi and and we did that. Did Bill Moore know from the get go that that's what was going on? No. Bill Bill Moore was recruited. Um, he was involved in something entirely unrelated to UFOs. Bill Moore had a contact. Uh, first of all, Bill Moore spoke Russian, right? And he had learned it in school, and he had a con he had contacts with. Uh, Soviet researchers, legitimate UFO Soviet researchers. He had a pen pal, or he called it a pen pal, but he had a contact with somebody inside Moscow, inside Soviet Union, inside Moscow, in Moscow, who, who they corresponded with back and forth. Well, we, we knew about that. And when we approached Bill, we wanted him to report to us what this scientist was saying and expanding that to uh, to allow us to make contact with this person, uh, the CIA make contact that that person inside uh, the, the Soviet Union, which which began an operation, and, and we that was very successful. And during this time period, uh, you know, of course, Bo uh, Bill had a number of uh, contacts. Uh, within APRO and uh, MUFON and some other agent, uh, some of the UFO community, right? Uh, because of the the book he wrote on uh, uh, the Philadelphia experiment, and then Roswell with with uh, uh, who's the guy uh, Berlitz? I yeah, think. yeah. And so, so we were interested, and we that was just kind of a second thought by our supervisors. Why don't we get him involved and get have him reporting? Uh, you know, uh, on what they're doing within APRO. And so he did, because Bill had a lot of access to, to, to APRO. And, and, and another person that was very, very, very cooperative with us, he wasn't my asset. I didn't recruit him, but somebody down in, uh, in Arizona out of uh, uh, Davis Mountain Air Force Base, one of the OS agents down there recruited him, was Wendell Stevens. No, Wendell was a, what? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Wendell was. Wendell would at, at the UFO conventions. Wendell would invite certain people up to his room and show us things that he had gotten from. He wouldn't tell us who or some some footage of something that he had gotten from somebody. He would never ever tell us, and I don't know that that maybe OSI knew about it because he was being handled by somebody down in Arizona and I didn't have privy to that information because it's pr pretty um, uh, 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 closely guarded. It's compartmented. But he would always show us things and 
And we, I walk away scratching my head, like, where did he get the hat? But, but Linda was, I mean, I could name some others, but, but they were, they were, uh, and we call them cooperate, cooperating people. Somebody would cooperate with us. They might not have uh, given us everything we wanted, but, and I think Window had been, had of course been in the Air Force, and 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 Window was, you could relate to him as being, you know, a former blue suitor because he was Air Force, right? And he would, you know, he would be more forthcoming. Uh, well, let, what, but what, he what, never. Let's get back to Wendell Stevens in in in, in just a bit. Let's get let, let's go back to Bill Moore for a second. Um, okay. Did uh, the MJ twelve documents? Did you supply those to Bill Moore? Absolutely not. Where did he get I mean, them that from? Was, that's been proven and 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 disproven by. I mean, I went through two FBI investigations on that crap, and I I I, I take two polygraphs. I didn't do it. I don't know who did. I, I, I have my suspicions, but uh, I can't prove it. And uh, I don't know that the government knows. Uh, but, but I didn't. Bill brought it, brought him to me, and I told Bill when I when he brought him to me, I said, Bill, I, I don't. Who gave these to you? He said, I can't tell you that. Well, shortly after this, this Jamie Shandera shows up, right? And I had never, I'd never met him or, or, or had anything to do with him. But, well, Jamie had a lot of contacts within DIA. He had names. He would drop names of people who I knew. I wouldn't, I wouldn't acknowledge that I knew him to, to Jamie, but he would, he would start naming these people, and I thought, well, how did he know? And I started thinking, maybe he's an asset, or maybe he's an agent. Jamie Shandera, the TV producer. Yeah, yeah. He looked asset ish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have looked, you ever met him? Uh, no, and I've I've tried to chase him down. You know, we live in broadcast out of Burbank, and that's that was uh, him and Bill Moore's headquarters for a number of years. Was right here. Yeah. Um, right. But I I don't I don't know if he's still alive. I I can't find any record on him. I would love to talk to he. He's got to be getting up there in years. He would be probably in his mid eighties, I would think. Well, in in two thousand six, let me see, two thousand five, no, two thousand six, he was alive. Um, he showed up at the uh, at the when they still had the UFO conventions at Laughlin. Mm-hmm. He showed up there with um, Bill Ryan and um, I. Can't think of Bill Ryan's girlfriend's name, but I'm, I don't know if you know them. But yeah, anyway, C- Carrie and, Cassidy. Carrie Cassidy. Carrie Cassidy. There we go. She's a she's a character. <laughs> she's a character. But, but anyway, anyways, um, he showed up, and uh, I knew. I mean, I just look at him and tell that he was on some kind of uh, either prescription drug or illegal drugs. He, he he just he would rant about things that happened to him. Um, he had m- marks on his body where he claimed that he had been on a beach at uh, some beach in California, and the Navy SEALs uh, landed and took him in a helicopter and took him to a, a Coronado, Coronado Island and put him in a brig and beat him because he saw uh, them training aliens. <laughs> so. I mean, that's that's just one of his many, many stories that he would tell. But that was the last time I saw him, so I, I have no idea where Jamie would be now today. Now, Bill Moore, for, for what seemed like forever, uh, going around to all of the conferences and the radio shows, and next week, just wait, I've got a new document, I've got a new letter, I've got a new official Air Force this, I've got this, and, and I'm going forward. Uh, it, it it was a weekly or monthly thing with Bill Moore. Did you supply him with those letters and documents that he kept uh, bringing forward? No. Where no. was he getting them from? I, you know what, Bill did his own thing. He had his own contacts, and uh, Bill uh, was on his own. And there's a lot of times uh, he was. He called me once and told me he was going to do a. Um, I'm not sure if it was a television or radio show 
Yeah, I believe it was in Seattle. And that's when his car was broken into and there was a number of documents stolen out of his briefcase. And he he called me and told me about this incident. And I said, Bill, what the heck are you doing running around? That, what kind of documents are they? And he told me. He said, well, they're documents that were given to me by some other people. I said, who? By who? He said, oh, I can't tell you that. I said, Bill, you running around doing this stuff. I, I suggest you not do it. Don't do it anymore. But he still did it. So, uh, and, and later on, I think probably after 86, uh, I just broke off contact with him. Uh, I, I didn't actually terminate him as a asset on paper, but I just didn't, uh, I listed him as a, uh, uh, non-cooperative, uh, asset. So I didn't really believe or, uh, uh, collect information that he was supplying. And I don't think he'd supplied much after that. What did you, what did you supply bill? Bill Moore? Yes. Um, as an asset, he's in the UFO community. He's an author. He's a researcher. He's a public speaker, uh, and doing his uh, and author books. What did you supply him that was disinfo? I didn't supply him anything that was disinfo. The problem with Bill Moore is that he was so vo- so much involved in the UFO, UFO community before I ever met him in nineteen like eighty or seventy nine, whenever it was, that. I couldn't, I couldn't disinform Bill. Bill already knew, and Bill could see things, and, and Bill had access. He had his own sources, which I didn't find out until years later. He had a colonel that was stationed at Norton Air Force Base that was uh, OSI, and I didn't find this out until 2001 or so. But he, this, this Air Force OSI agent was giving him information. Now, whether he was using him too as an asset, I don't know. But I never gave Bill a thing, any disinformation, because if I would have tried, Bill would have doubted me. He would have caught, said, "I don't want to. I don't want to muddy the waters. I'm already in good with these people. If I bring something in that's not true, and there's so many other people that figure it out, it's not true. Then." My credibility is down the drain, so so we didn't do that with Bill. Well, why did uh, you're calling him an asset though? What did he do for you? He reported to us. Well, on the Soviet thing, that's entirely that, that's a counter espionage operation that he was he was involved with, which I'm not even going to go into details on that. He was doing that, and plus he was a member of a UFO group. He would tell us what they were doing. Hey, they had a meeting. They discussed all these different sightings. So and so is in charge. So and so is a field investigator. Here's the phone numbers. Uh, he, here's how many field reports they did, and things like that. That's what he reported back to us. And, and why was that important to the Air Force? To keep track of the UFO community, to keep track of what they were doing, because the the more eyes and ears you have. In, a, in the intelligence community, the better it's going to be. If you have a thousand people reporting back to us on what they're doing, what they're seeing, and what's occurring in their area, then that's that's better for the United States. That's better for national security because we can keep track then of what's occurring. Now, you know, ninety percent of everything that Bill's reporting, as far as reports that the APRO or 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 Mufon was was receiving was probably fully explainable because remember in that time period, we didn't have project blue book anymore. So we had, we still were interested in, 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 in reports and of, of sightings of, 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 of objects. And, and some of them could be Soviet or could be hostile. So that's why we were doing it as part of a big plan. It was just not, it was all over the United States. In fact, all over the world, we were doing this, trying to keep, uh, a track of what uh, was occurring that we we the Air Force didn't know. Were you there when he did the uh, you know did the speech where he came clean and ran out the back door in Las Vegas? Nineteen ninety one. No, no, I wasn't there. You weren't but, there. But but Bill told me uh, Bill uh, I met Bill in um, 
in in uh, Laughlin before this because it was in Vegas. But I, I, I we we met in Laughlin, and Bill told me what he was going to do, and I we had dropped him in probably eighty eight or um, eighty seven or I'm, I'm not sure. We dropped him. We just told him no more. I'm not going to pay you for travel or pay you for anything. So it's over with. And he said, okay, I, he under, fully understands this. And then he, he then I, I had contact with him occasionally here and there. And, and, and we met in Laughlin, I think it was a, a two or three days before the, the Vegas uh, speech. And he told me exactly what he was going to do. And he said, and he was, he was quite uh, um, irritating to me um, of, because he said, I'm going to do this and nobody's going to change my mind. And he, he gave me a draft of his speech and I looked at it and I said, you know, there's a lot of things in here, Bill, I wouldn't suggest you. He said, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do it. I said, fine, Bill, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stop you. You want to do it, do it. And he did. How much did you pay? Then, how much, how much did you pay uh, Bill Moore? Um, we paid him for travel. We paid him for um, uh, mostly what we paid him for, just travel or, or expenses. Uh, but we didn't actually pay him a salary. We Cash. Reimburse him for travel. Cash. Pardon? Cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cash. Always cash. And he signed for it. Okay. You know, yeah, he has a, has a form, and 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 he signed for it, and then we. He, he signs the IRS uh, form, too. So, you know, there's two forms he had to sign. But I mean, it was never a lot of money. I mean, I don't think I ever, ever paid him more than $45, $50, something like that, $30. So why do it, then? I mean, I mean, for Bill, why do it? I mean, I, I don't I understand. Don't know. I, I, and, you know, <laughs> and today he's a he's a janitor for a junior high school in Pennsylvania living in a trailer. You know, why? I mean, why? Why go down that road? How many others? Um, and I, I'm going to apologize to the network and all of our sponsors. I've blown through all of the commercials, but and I've never done this before. I'll pay the price uh, for this in the future. OK, so uh, that those phone calls are coming in tomorrow. Um, how many other assets <laughs> did you have in in ufology? I, there was Bill Moore. Um, how many me others? Me personally. Me personally. No, the Air Force. Had, and, well, okay, let's do oh, you. Well, let's do you personally first because that you would know that directly. How many? I had. Um, I had three. Do and I, I and this was just in the New Mexico area. Do I know those yeah. three? Uh, well, Bor, Bill Moore being one of them. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, four. Bill would be one, and then there'd be three others. Uh, um, one of them's dead. One of them died many, many years ago. Uh, and the other two um, are still. I don't know that they're involved in the UFO community. One was APRO, and and one was Mufon. Right. Uh, in, in, the, in the Southwest area. And I'm not going to disclose their names. I no, don't you don't to have become... to. You don't have to. Okay. If I don't know them and it's APRO and it's MUFON and, and they're older now and, and not involved. Okay. Um, now, what about the Air Force in general? Uh, did they have, if you had yours, certainly there were others um, under the control of the Air Force. Can you put a number on that? Well, you figure there was 122 Air Force OSI agents that were involved in this program. Mm -hmm. There were 122 that had been briefed, and that's worldwide, that I knew of in 19, well, I knew of uh, as late as 88. And out of those 122, every one of them was required to have assets and up to three or four. So you do the math, there were quite a few I don't know names. I don't know numbers exactly now after all these years. But I know that uh, I know one particular uh, asset who uh, was uh, probably one of the better ones uh, was one of the senior officials in APRO. Uh, I mean, uh, MUFON. I think he was an APRO and MUFON, but he was one of the 
he was one of the senior people. Uh, and, 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 and I knew he was involved. I knew because the agent that was handling him always bragged about how, how he recruited this guy. And, you know, he was one of the senior directors and, and he was getting all sorts of information from him. So I knew there was some, uh, at least one senior official on our side. And and I understand the collecting of um, of information from inside of these organizations going out, but what about the the disinformation going back into these organizations? Be it rumor, be it photographs, uh, uh, documents, or just stories? Uh, did that occur? No, we were specifically. You know that's a pretty um, that's a pretty strong no coming out of you. Yeah, absolutely not. We were not allowed. Um, we were specifically forbidden to do that unless there was some type of operation that specifically targeted a particular incident, such as if if give me a, I'll give you an example. If uh, John Smith is driving down a road and the UFO lands next to him and shuts his vehicle off and and the only person that had gained any knowledge about this UFO was uh, the field investigator for MUFON or APRO. And so they do a report and they don't send it to anybody, but they keep it in. But our asset within that APRO or MUFON gives it to us. Now we're going to start an investigation. And now maybe we would try some kind of counterintelligence operation against the person, not, not, not the field investigator, not the group, but, but the person that had the encounter. Is, That's the only time we would be allowed to do something like that. Does, uh, does the Air Force, OSI, um, do they have assets right now inside of MUFON? I I left in eighty eight. I have no idea. I oh, would imagine. Oh, okay. You can imagine that they do. Do you uh, now? Do you still communicate at all with anybody in the Air Force OSI? We have a group of retired association of retired intelligence officers, and within that group, there's a there's another uh, smaller group that uh, all of us had been involved in that program. And it wasn't just OSI. It was some some guys had been FBI that had been briefed into a DIA, and we have a few uh, CIA uh, officers. And we meet uh, annually or sometimes semi-annually. And there's there's uh, about 52 left. There's a lot more years ago, but they die off. And and we still meet, and we sit and talk. And none of us are involved. None of us have security clearances anymore. None of us uh, have access to anything. But others tell us things. And we have ways of, of obtaining information. And we meet and we talk about it. And I know that there's probably uh, a good intelligence network uh, still alive, just like the way we had it. And maybe even better than we had it. Did you, um, I think you've talked about this in the past, but uh, did you, did you operate undercover? Did you go to these meetings um, as a civilian? I would go to, um, I have, yes, I have, I have. I've gone through some UFO conventions back in the 80s, uh, not as, as myself, yes, I have. And does the Air Force, uh, man, do, do you feel strange admitting that today? Does it feel a little dirty? If I'm, uh, I missed it. I mean, I mean did, 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 does, I, does do it, I feel strange that the Air Force sent me, or what? What would you? What I you mean, mean, you know, it's clandestine. It's inside of the United States. You're, you know, you're. You're in the Air Force, and then going to a UFO convention or conference, or um, at dress as a civilian, and and going in and doing that on U.S. soil. You, you know, we're not enemy combatants here, right? <laughs> we're American citizens. Well, 
well, all I'm doing, all I did was sit and listen. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't do anything clandestine or uh, uh, undercover. I mean, I sat there and listened to uh, the speakers and, and, and maybe mingled with some people and listened to some, some people talk or, Something but, like that, but, but uh, you didn't tell I didn't them. Do but you illegal. Didn't. I didn't do anything. Um, and 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 you talking about dresses as civilian undercover. I wore civilian clothes the entire time I was in OSI. I mean, I, you, you, we didn't wear uniforms. Well, that's what I'm uh, saying. Well, that's Richard. That's what I'm saying. You didn't tell anybody that you were in the Air Force and that you worked for the OSI. You didn't. You know, you didn't disclose that at no. these meetings either. Yeah. Now, uh, now, what about no, others? I did. I did. No, no, no. I did. I had. I had to disclose it to my supervisor. In fact, I was directed to go. No, to not my, your supervisor. I'm talking about the people, the civilians at the conferences. They didn't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, no, no, they didn't know. No. Right, it. right. Now, um, what about those other 120, uh, uh, 122? Um, that were in this program with you in the Air Force. It was around the world, but certainly a, a chunk of them were inside of the United States. They were doing the exact same thing, weren't they? Yes. That is a massive infiltration. Massive. I don't know who to trust. <laughs> uh, right? Well, am you I, know what? Am I wrong? It wasn't, in... just, it wasn't just OSI. Office of Navy Intelligence had their own right, people. Right. Uh, the FBI had a FBI had a really extensive network, uh, and uh, and I don't know about the Army. I know I know OSI and Navy. I I, I don't know about that. I can't speak for the Army. And so there was. It's got to be going. Well, see, you know, as you know, I speak at these conferences. Uh, some of them are really, really large. You can't yep. you can't know everybody that is attending. But I've often suspected that there must be some of them out there. You don't know. if They could be women or men or young. Or old. You, you just don't know. That's the first thing. But the second thing is these presenters and these people that are around me that we are friends and, and um, compatriots, right? But are you saying that yeah. some of them may be assets because that's what you did? I would say, uh, yes, I would say that every UFO group is has probably assets uh, belonging to some kind of intelligence uh, agency, whether it would be OSI, FBI, or whoever, and and they're reporting back what the group is doing. Yes, I, I, I don't know that for a fact. I, I've been out uh, 30 some years so i can't say for sure but i would i would guess it probably is still happening is there somebody today on the circuit that you knew from back then that was an asset oh yes two mm -hmm. people Really? That I I, no, I, I don't need names. I don't need. I don't. I don't. I I need to sleep tonight, so I don't need names. But no, but, I'm not going to tell you any names. But, but there are two people. One one more prominent than the other. I mean, the one is probably. I don't. I don't have to keep track of the one, but the one is you hear about him within the UFO community now and then is involved it, it was was an asset and probably still i don't know if he still is or not and the other person i i don't know uh, but they were and and i i would imagine that there still are i i can in fact i the well the last uh, uh ufo convention i was at 2010 uh, the last one window was at uh i pointed out to window and some others in this group All right uh, of who I knew in the audience that were either DIA or Air Force. I pointed them out right there, one, two, three, and there were something like six of them. And they were scattered around the room. And I remember when George <clears throat> Knapp did his um, uh, uh, Skywalker Ranch a presentation at UFO convention in uh, Laughlin. I, I don't remember what year, 2000, whatever, five or six or whenever it was. Uh, I was there. And there were 20, 
20 uh, air, uh, uh, intelligence personnel in that room, 20. And I knew every single one of them. The, 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 I, I just, the community, the UFO community is so freaked out about this. Uh, not for about what you're saying. I'm saying that this could be occurring. And you know that this is something that you can almost touch and feel when you go to these conferences. Everybody is aware. They're looking for the feds, right? They're looking for the feds. They're looking they, because trust in this community is is paramount, Richard. And you know this. You, you've known this for years. Trust is there, and everybody is suspicious, and and now you are saying that yes, this has been going on. Uh, the, the amount of numbers which you just told me, if every one hundred and twenty-two uh, agents with four assets each, we're looking at five hundred, five hundred, five. That that is a big chunk of people. That's a that's a that's a large number. So when you go to these conferences, you you don't know who to trust. Well, that was back in the 80s. I, I can't speak for what how many there are now, but I would guess, I mean, just just common sense tells you that the government's going to be keeping track of it. I mean, and, and they're not violating any laws. They're just there listening to what you're saying, what what the speakers are saying. They're not uh, they're not uh, trying to co- uh, convince anybody of anything. Uh, and we never did. We went to the conventions and we were there to listen and listen to what their speakers were saying. Uh, and, you know, some of them we found very interesting. And and then we report back, do a report back that, hey, we went to this UFO convention and 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 we and so many this speakers spoke about this. This guy lectured about this. So and so and so and so and so and so. And and that's it. That's it. We we didn't you know, tap any rooms or wiretap, we would, would be prohibited from doing anything like that. We never did anything illegal. We did, we just sat there and listened. So yes, but- I, I, I think, it, I think the UFO community, they don't have anything uh, to hide. Um, and they, they wouldn't have anything to lose by sitting in a room with, uh, with 50 intelligence officers and, and, and lecturing to a crowd of 5,000 with 50 in the room. What difference would it make? Well, but but that's that's the interesting part for me. When you're suggesting that, you know, the infiltration is there, the assets are there, they're inside of the community, reporting back to you and the other agents, uh, these, are, these are agents with a career, they're getting paid, and they have a job to do, and these assets, after hanging out at an after party or this, or at the, picking up the phone and calling their handler, saying, okay, this happened at the conference today. So-and-so said this. Somebody had this. Somebody had this photograph of the. And if that is going on, that is nuts. And that's exactly what you're saying happened, right? Well, I don't, I can't say that, <laughs> I well, can't say I can't speak for anybody but myself. I can't speak for any of these other agents of what they were getting or how much information they were getting, whether they were getting documents or, or reports or photographs. Uh, it, it wasn't as, as prevalent as you might make it sound to be. There, there, there wasn't some kind of a, um, the po- a repository where, where thousands of, of pages of, of information coming out of these UFO groups were being filed. It wasn't like that. Very, very, in fact, Bill Moore uh, d- didn't give a whole lot of information uh, and or the other assets I had, uh, some gave me stuff that was already printed in a newspaper or a magazine or or I listened to on a radio or was in a newspaper or a television report. So it wasn't any kind of secrets that was occurring within the UFO community. It was stuff that they call would call me and say, Hey, you know, we took uh, four reports yesterday or last week or last month or six months ago about these sightings that occurred in, in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico or silver city or wherever. 
Okay. And I would say, okay, uh, and, and I would already, probably already know a lot of it. So I, I can only speak for myself about what I was getting from these assets. Okay, two quick questions, and I, I'm going to thank you in advance for for this surprise visit, number one. Number two, for for allowing me to drill you <laughs> these questions for the last hour and a half. I didn't expect this, and, and again, I apologize to all of our sponsors on the show and the network. Uh, uh, for neglecting my commercial breaks. Well, I sure hope you don't get in trouble. I, you know what? You know what, Richard? Some things have to be. You know, it's uh, it is what it is. Okay. Uh, first question: the aviary, fictitious, created? It was created by somebody else. I, I <laughs> in fact, the, the the absolute truth is that aviary was was already being uh, circulated, and I didn't even know I was involved in it. I, I Honest to God, I did not know uh, I was involved. And I can't really put a finger on who started it. I, I thought it might have been Robert Collins, right. but he denies it. He says it was uh, Jamie Shandera right. or, or somebody, or uh, Carrie, or, but I don't know. I don't know who started it. Were you and, involved? And the people that were involved, uh, names, uh, were, uh, I mean, some of them like Dr. Uh, Hal Putoff and Dr. Kit Green, who are very good friends of mine today, they would call me and say, what's this Avery thing? And I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't start it. I, I don't know what. So somebody else started it. Who was Falcon. Falcon, the real Falcon, mm -hmm. the real, real Falcon was Richard Helms. Really? Yeah. Uh, okay. Now Richard Helms was the real, real Falcon. And to cover him, I was, was named Falcon because Richard Helms uh, was my uh, very, very, very dear friend. He was, a, he was my father. He was friends of my father's. And then, uh, of course, I knew him from that, but I, I became friends with him right up until he passed away. And, 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 and Richard was the, uh, he was the real Falcon. I'm, I'm, and that's been, that's not, uh, that's not news. I mean, it's been out for some time. It, it's, it's been out, but I didn't, I did not know that you and him had that relationship that I didn't know. There were rumors going on forever that uh, Dick Helms was uh, was indeed the real Falcon. Um, yep. Now, and I had now you, you, you should hear some of his stories. <laughs> well, I've I've say, I saw his uh, <laughs> recent interviews uh, that he did. Uh, uh, the there's a documentary out. The surviving uh, head of the CIA directors, right? They all get together and talk about the bomb. I don't know if uh, yeah. if you've seen that, but uh, it's pretty interesting. Um. Uh, okay, you know, again, I want to thank you. I had one more question, but uh, I, I can't. I've lost it. It was in front of me. <laughs> I had one more question, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, Richard, I, I again, thank you uh, for calling in. What we should do? I mean, I was completely unprepared for this, um, but uh, if you'd like, now I understood. You knew I was calling. No, this no, I got, <laughs> no, 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 no. I got okay. a text. Okay. I got a text to look out for uh, four numbers, your last four. That's what I got. I didn't okay. know. I, I, okay. I had, I had no idea. I, and I was you know, okay. told to look out for this phone number. So no, 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 absolutely not. Which, you know what? And that's the beauty part of this, especially when it's live radio. <laughs> if I would have known, yeah. I would have said, Richard Doty's calling in tonight. And I, you know, <laughs> absolutely not. I was told to look out for these last four digits. And uh, there you go. So, um, and, and again, thank you. And let's uh, schedule uh, something in, in the future. What you, you mentioned uh, that you were working on a television show or, or, or a documentary. What are you doing? It's a documentary. There's a couple of them I'm working on uh, that uh, are being filmed uh, in Nevada, uh, in around uh, Area 51. Not not in Area 51, around it, Warm Springs. Uh, there's some things occurring out there that are really mysterious. So we're we're doing a, a 
So. Okay. All right. Well, good luck with that. Oh, I know what my question was. It was about Bill Cooper. Uh, was Bill Cooper, he's somebody that I respect. He's one of the reasons why I do radio today. Um, but was he an asset? No. Was not mine. Okay. Oh, not yours. So you don't know. No, no, I don't know. I don't know that he was. I don't know. I have no idea whether he was. Were, were there, no. okay, and uh, was there any influence in the media, other show host or television through through the Air Force or the Pentagon on the UFO subject? Um, not that I was involved with. Uh, I, 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 I better not answer that. What I know is I better not answer it. So the answer is yes. Oh, otherwise, you would say no. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, oh, are you under any uh, security agreements right now with the Air Force? No. Um, no, mine, mine, ended, mine ended in 20, uh, 2008. Or, uh, yeah, 2008. Uh, 2008. And is... Um, uh, 2000, I'm sorry, yeah. What did I say? 2080? Uh, uh, no, 2000, you said yeah. 2008. And, well, so uh, you're retired. Are you... Are you receiving a retirement pay? I'm receiving a, yeah, I'm receiving a. It's okay. My dad, my, my dad retired after 33 years. He's getting paid. I'm, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Are you? Yeah, in, I'm, I'm being paid. Are you? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Are you in jeopardy of, of though, of your retirement pay by speaking about this kind of stuff on this show? No. So you're free to talk. No. Well, there are things that I won't talk about. I mean, there are things that I did that are still probably classified, and I'm not going to talk about it. Would you talk? The, the things that I know that are secretive or, or top secret or code word or things that are very sensitive, uh, I'm not going to talk about it. Would you, but, would but you talk things to Things that have already been out in the press, I, I'm, 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 I'm not afraid to talk about it. Would you talk to me about it in person or off of the air? About anything. You're supposed to say it yes. On the question. It, it, would be, it would depend on the question. Well, no, it would, be t- it, would, it would depend on the dinner, and I don't play around when I take <laughs> somebody out to dinner. I That I can promise. Well, it might be, it might be that, too. Yeah, I, uh, I like seafood. <laughs> there you go. Richard Doty, <laughs> thank you for the surprise call, and let's do this okay. again, and we'll plan it out, and we'll actually have some structure to it, okay? Okay, Jimmy. Thank you, Richard. Okay, take care. Okay, bye You too, you too. Well, there you go. Uh, yes, I was completely caught by surprise, and and I think that uh, if if anybody here at Fade to Black knew about this in advance, uh, they are enjoying themselves knowing that I was caught completely by surprise. Uh, with that, I was told to look out for these last four numbers, and I, 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 t- I took the call. Uh, when it when it came in, I did not know. So there you go, Richard Doty. Um, I I was unprepared. I hope that for everybody here uh, in the Fade to Black audience that happened to listen to this live tonight, that I asked the questions that needed to be asked. I've uh, always wanted to have the opportunity to interview him, and I. I hope that I did. Uh, I, I hope that I asked the questions. Wow, I'm I'm just blown away. I'm blown away just like everybody else is. Um, Richard's history, his appearance in Mirage Men, uh, I was uncomfortable with. He was in unacknowledged, and I was a little bit uncomfortable with that too as well. And the there's two parts to his past. There's the urban legend part that has been out there where things get uh, things get spread around. And then there's the other part. There's the official part that he has always spoken on. So what, you know, it, what's the real truth? And is it somewhere down the middle? Again, uh, Richard knows that it was his job, as he said tonight, to be a a disinformation agent. And that's what he did for, he was an agent for the um, uh, OSI of the Air Force, and he worked uh, under orders. Okay, that's 
That's it. Um, is it an uncomfortable thing? Yes, it is for me. I am uh, completely uncomfortable with it. Completely. Completely. And the other part, and this is what I stressed with him tonight, uh, and I'm sure he's listening right now, which is this kind of stuff going on inside of the United States on American soil with American citizens is a bit funky. That's the part I'm just a little bit uncomfortable with. Whether they didn't spread disinfo, okay, well, that's that's his story, and he he's going to stick to it and as well he should. But the other part of it is we're not enemy combatants. Whatever the Air Force wants to do with this overseas with in a foreign country or, you know, but here you go off of the Air Force base, off of the Air Force base to a civilian gathering, um, that's, that's, that's a bit funky. And to, to have assets reporting back to you from inside of these organizations, that's a bit, that's a bit funky to me. I'm a little bit, uh, uncomfortable with it and I'm not sure what really is going on. And I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever know the truth. One thing is for sure. Me asking Richard Doty these questions, I can't go more direct to the source then Richard Doty, and I will do my best. And I think uh, he uh, he answered he answered everything. I got to give him credit for that. Coming into here, <laughs> he's uh, he's strong. Richard Doty is strong. All right, that concludes another week on Fade to Black. I uh, I'm taking the weekend off with my wife uh, this weekend. We are not working. We work for the last uh, three four weeks in a row. Uh, so there you go. We're taking tomorrow off. Thank you. Thank you, Richard Doty. And you know what? Didn't have a chance to take any phone calls tonight. Well, and if I did take a phone call, thank you. Fade to Black's executive producers, Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm and Renee, Dennis, and Bob. <coughs> oh. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitello, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster, Drew the Geek, Music, Doug Aldrich, Intro, Space Boy, SpaceboyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. It's broadcast on a copyright of 2017 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. Cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until Monday, everybody be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.